I was faced with the choice to either continue trying to act and wait for someone to give me a job or leave the business, or the final resort was to try to create my own work. So I opened up a theater company in 1968 in Los Angeles to act, write, and direct almost all of my own work, which I did. Uh, I would borrow $1,000 or $2,000 from a friend while I was working as a bartender and produce my own work on the stage, sort of what every one of you can do today. Well, the Narcissist Theater Company, wasn't the it? The Narcissist yeah, Theater exactly. Company, there it is. I, I will do it all, act, write, and direct. But truthfully, th that was the choice. The choice was to leave the business or try to create the work myself because there was no other choice to do it. And I did do that, and, uh, and I did start writing and directing my own plays and eventually stopped acting. Uh, all together. Paul would continue to try to offer me work and I would turn him down always. Um, and those things led to my first big produced play in Los An in New York. Uh, Warner Brothers studio executives saw it, offered me my first job in screenwriting, which I, uh, I, I spent about three years working on it for about a total of another $2,000 over two or three years. But the gift was that I was being paid to learn how to write a screenplay from that producer. Eventually, I read a, uh, I wrote a spec script based on one of my plays, Paul. Spec script is what? Spec uh, script is what? This is a great question. A spec script is something that nobody believes in but you. No one will pay you for it, uh, and no one has asked to even read it. But you believe in it, and so you go to work on it. And so I wrote this spec script on the speculation that someone might want to read it. Uh, a friend of mine got it to Paul Haggis, who was a big television producer and writer at the time. He was a showrunner, which is what everybody wants to be in television. And I got a phone call one day while I was still bartending in Los Angeles from this guy named Paul Haggis, who said, you know, I read your spec script, and I'd like to talk to you about a television show uh, that I'm doing. And I was a playwright. I wasn't a television guy. You know, I, if it was a movie, maybe I would have put some faith in it. Uh, and then he sent me this script with what called Easy Streets, which eventually Time Magazine called the possibly the best television show in the history of television. And this is my entree into t writing for television with Paul Haggis and one of the greatest shows in the history of television. That was how it all began. Which lasted a total of one week. A total of one week. <laughs> <laughs> a little more than that. But it w if, if you ever get time to watch a really great television show created by Paul Haggis, I was lucky enough to work on it. It's called Easy Streets. I don't think you can find it. I don't think it's anywhere. Really? Yeah, you can't find it. Well, then I'm sorry you won't get to see it. And to be very honest, uh, things went really well from there on in. Um, I was broke a couple of years after that, and Paul and I wrote some more of the spec scripts together that he invited me to write with him, which won some Academy Awards, but I'll let him talk about that. But that was my beginning, and that's where I am now. Uh, and uh, that was, that was you started as an actor at what, 16? 17. Yeah. Uh, 17 started studying. Yes, and for what, what do you think? Fifty-three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> fifty-three years ago. One hundred and forty-two years yeah, ago. Exactly. We'll just say that. Uh, and uh, what do you find most satisfying? I know it's a, it's uh, difficult to, uh, to, to to pin down, but of, of of everything you do, what what do you like most? Of everything I do, if we're not counting the paycheck. Yeah, yeah. Be, because the paycheck is important when you have a wife and two children, and now other family members. What I find most enjoyable is directing a new play for the stage. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's everything. So it's still in your bones, yeah, directing, directing a play. A new play. A theater, a piece a of theater. A new play for the stage. That, that's, that's the thing that's most fun for me. Um, but the other stuff is still great fun. Well, let's hop over to that because you have experience in all these things. Uh, what would you say, I, I hear people talking, saying these things, but well, I'm, I'm hearing somebody talking right now. Uh, uh, it's uh, yourself. Uh, I'm hearing myself talking. You, you can take the microphone if you'd like to talk. No, 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 you just uh, turn, <laughs> maybe you turn this down here, this speaker. The Ah, uh, grazie, yeah, I'm boring myself, thank you very much. Uh, people, I heard somebody talks about something earlier, an, an actor this week, uh, and I think you were, pre I'm not sure if you were present or not, but uh, he or she, I can't remember who, uh, was talking about the fact, oh, I remember who it was. She was talking about the fact that, uh, you know, she'd learned to act uh, in high school or something in plays and then went on to do some plays and then uh, eventually had to learn how to act for the screen, for movies. And I kind of took her to task uh, because I said, well, there are different techniques that one has to employ uh, in acting for the stage or for the screen. 
basically it's the same bl bloody thing. You have to tell the truth in either medium. Uh, and uh, people who think that, I'm answering my own question, by the way. No, uh, pe people that think that there are two completely different styles, there's acting for the stage and acting for the cinema, aren't acting in either one. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, the, the, it is, you have to learn how to project, okay, and you have to learn how to, to whisper on stage and be heard in the back, back row. That is true, that's a technique, that's a piece of the craft. Uh, there are there are pieces of the craft in cinema. You have to know how how to stand and and not be blocked by the other actor in front of the camera. You know how to place your body, some awareness. There's things like that. But acting is acting is acting. So what do you say to people who say, no, I'm, I'm a theater actor. I'm a uh, uh, I'm a, 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 a film actor. I'm a television actor. And, and they, what do, what do you say to these people? I, I, I say to anyone who has that question that Paul is absolutely correct. Acting at its essence is the ability to live in the imaginary circumstances, to refuse to anticipate the next moment, to really talk, to really listen, and to stay in the moment. After that, there's the question of craft and there's the question of technique. And the craft and the technique for the stage is different than the craft and the technique for television, which is different than the craft and the technique for filmmaking, believe it or not, to a certain extent. But at its essence, the art of acting is exactly what I just said, the ability to live within the, in, the uh, given circumstances of the play, to follow the impulses, to really talk, to really listen, and to refuse to anticipate what's coming. Even though you've worked for a hundred years on the text and you know every word, if you anticipate that word coming, you are in trouble. You no longer are a good actor. Yeah, you're, you know, you're saying the lines. Yeah, you're saying the lines. Um, the, and yet how many actors fall into that trap? 95% of the actors you work with fall into that trap, 95% yeah. of yeah. them. Yeah, For good many, actors, skilled actors. Excellent actors for many different reasons. Your job, uh, and Paul does this very well, and I'd like to think I'm fairly good at it as well, is as a director is to see an actor doing that, to try to understand why he's doing that, and then to articulate in such a way he can stop doing that. <laughs> Without necessarily putting their attention on it. Without putting yeah. their attention. Because you say to an actor, you're anticipating the moment. He says, no, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> and now you're yeah. going to try. Now you've you got the, the whole camera crew waiting for you to have this argument. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, being in the moment, absolutely. Not anticipating what's going to happen. Not knowing. I mean, I remember I've had actors, un, uh, new actors. Now, there's one that we and I both worked with. I remember in rehearsals. Uh, we, we both, and a wonderful performance this actor ended up giving terrific but I remember the second day of rehearsals for a movie and he came in and said Paul I did it I said what I said I figured out exactly how I'm gonna say that line I went no 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 please don't do that <laughs> no 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 put that out of your mind don't even think it. no I'm gonna say it no don't say it <laughs> because that's the worst thing you can possibly do is fix the performance is figure out how you're gonna say it what was it Uta ha who's who said figure out what you're gonna say not how you're gonna say it yeah yeah they, and that's the most important thing is know what you're gonna say never how you're gonna say it Paul's alluding also to the fact that even as you're working on the lines, if you find yourself saying them, stop. Mm, yeah. When you're all alone, if you find yourself saying the lines out loud or looking into a mirror what you look like, stop. Stop. It's the worst thing, stop. An, worst thing an actor can do. And it's what most actors do. You learn the lines and also, or you learn the lines with a cadence, with a rhythm, with something, and you learn them the same way over and over. This is the way I'm going to do that. Da, 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 da. And so you get on stage and that's set. Absolute set. It stops you from finding anything creative. Yeah. And, so, and to get to break an actor of doing that is very difficult when they've really learned it. We had that experience again on the same movie with another actor who, in the auditions, was a, you know, a young actor who was wonderful. And I went, oh, this is going to be a great scene. And that actor went home and for three months worked on that scene. And when that actor, I'm not going to say he or she, got to the set, it was impossible to get that performance that, that they originally brought. I remember that day well. It was just, I, I, I have a lot of tricks. You have a lot of tricks. All those tricks failed. Finally, I shot that person, that actor. I turned around after multiple, multiple takes. I said, okay, I'll take the pressure off. 
shoot the other actor. As soon as I did, that actor was great. Fantastic. There was no pressure anymore. <laughs> so I sit and my producers are looking at me like this and I go, I'm turning it around again. So I relit and shot that way again. And the person once again was a piece of wood, the, the, you know. The camera went on. Uh, so because they remembered, and the, no, so that's the worst thing you can possibly. Finally, it was good. Finally, it took a lot, I mean, many more hours than it should have. It was a simple scene, and that actor was great from the moment they walked in. But it took so long, and that's what you don't want in a performance. So if you're not working on the lines, what are you working on? Can anybody tell me? All right, I'm going to tell you. Oh, good. Please tell me. Here's what you're working on. You learn the lines well enough where you don't have to worry about them. You don't think about them. You don't. Th you know them so well. You do something called the fast exercise where you trust that they're going to be there. Then you place yourself in the scene and you work on what are the imaginary circumstances? Who am I? Where did I come from? What do I want out of this scene? And then the most important thing, what's in the way? And often what's in the way is what the other actor is doing. So you concentrate on the other actor. And whatever the other actor gives you, no matter what, you bounce off that with the impulse of moment to moment reality. Yeah, Except I'm <laughs> when there's another situation, and I was with a wonderful actress, uh, and I mean, one of our great actresses, and I was directing her, and she, again, not going to tell you the film, and she was doing a two person scene with another great actor, great actor, and uh, the, uh, the camera was on her. You know, and uh, over that actor's shoulder on her. And I, I didn't understand what she was doing. And uh, so she came to me and said, Paul, he hates me. I said, he <laughs> doesn't hate you? What the hell are you talking about? He adores you. He said, sneak around that side and for the next take, watch his face. I went, what? Oh, fine. So I walked around and he's going through the entire take. And, and I, said, I said, the actress's name, okay. Here's the problem. You, and this is a moment, this, it's, a, it's not a love scene, but it's a flirtation scene. It's a scene where they're supposed to, the chemistry is supposed to start bubbling up here. And, uh, and I said her name, here's the problem. When the camera turns around on him, he's gonna be magnificent. He's gonna be charming, he's gonna be, be great. And you're gonna look terrible. <laughs> so. I don't care what he's doing right now. I don't care he's got his finger up his nose. You have to, you have to dig in and, 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 and bring it. And she did. And it's like, wow. It's like, if you can do that, you're a skilled actress. But that, that's really hard to do. So hard. And, I mean, the person's like, you know, and you're like, no, no. It's like, you have to pretend the person's flirting with you or whatever. But she did because she's that good. And, and, and we what, turned around exactly what I said. He was like charming and wonderful. <laughs> I don't know what was up his ass. That it's, uh, it, it's, you know, that, that, that actor who did that to Paul and that other actor should be ashamed of himself. When you're off camera for another person's scene, it's your responsibility to give them what they need. Everything they need. I, direct, I was lucky enough to direct Dennis Hopper in three different things, right? Two television shows and a movie. And Dennis, who is one of the great stars of all time, one of the great professionals, when he was off camera, he'd be right behind me. And if you've got a line here, he'd be giving you ad libs. And he'd be laughing at one time and crying at another and giving you all kinds of stuff to work with. Yeah. That's what an actor does. That's what a professional does. Learn yeah. from Dennis Hopper. Don't learn from that other actor. Yeah, actors. the most important thing an actor can ever do is give. Yes. <laughs> uh, whether you're on camera or off camera, your job is to give. Uh, and, uh, and so. Uh, be generous. Yes. Be be really really generous, and hopefully it will come back. No, it will come back. I'm Not necessarily in that scene, but <laughs> it will come back. <laughs> you had, but you have to trust that. I mean, Paul's absolutely that right. When an actor gives, when a, when an actor gives to another actor, you know, you have, uh, how many of you have heard of the re repeat exercise? How many of you heard? Uh, repeat exercise is based on an exercise developed by Sandy Miser at the Neighborhood Playhouse. And the entire exercise, one of the great acting exercises in, in theater history, truly, um, is I give you, you give to me. You say the line, that's a white shirt. And I say the line, that's a white shirt, based on what you gave me and based on the impulse that bubbles up from what your line was. And the next impulse takes you somewhere else, like a pinball machine. Yeah. And imp those impulses create something alive. And it's life that we are looking for. Do you want to do this exercise? Uh, no. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, you, you, have that's you guys? A, no, here. Uh, I'm, not, a, I'm not an actor that's, anymore. That's, I've never been an actor. Okay. That's a white shirt. That's a white shirt. That's a white shirt? That's a white shirt. 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 That's a, that's a white shirt. That's a white shirt. That's a white shirt. 
That's how you do it. So, <laughs> I, I, I didn't know what Paul was going to say, but I said the line based on what he gave me. Yeah. He said the line based on what I gave him. Yeah. And, 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 and sometimes those exercises go everywhere. When I first started studying this exercise, I was with Bruno Kirby, John Voigt, Sean Penn, Nicole Kid, not Nicole Kidman, who was Sean Penn married to back then? Robin, uh, who, Wright. Robin Wright. They were all in the same class learning this exercise, this technique developed by Sandy Meisner. You know, great exercises. Meisner did many, obviously many of them came out of the school you attended. Uh, and uh, you know, there's, there's, there's wonderful ones. And you use what works for you. I mean, the method works for many, many people. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so those who attend to the neighborhood playhouse think differently, and they do the it's Meisner a, exercise. And whatever, whatever you. You can use work. all of them. You know, Stella Radler fought vehemently with Lee Strasberg, uh, and and they fought vehemently with U Uta Hagen. But you take what works for you. If it's Uta's work, great, take her. If it's Stella's work, take her. If it's Lee Strasberg, take her. If you want to know the difference, Lee Strasberg was all about the actor and his technique. Uh, Stella Adler was all about the playwright and what the play needs from the actors. So there's a difference in the approach, but it's all about what works for you. But and that's an interesting thing right there, is because uh, not enough, well, good act, great actors know what they are servicing. And that's the play or the movie or, or, or the television show, whatever, they're servicing that. They are, they are there to do that job. And then, they have to be a great actor in that scene and get what they need from this this moment, but they have to service the, well, the, the play. It's so, it's so important, and so many actors, uh, and I'm a member of the actor's studio. I love the studio. I've been there for 40 years. Uh, but so many actors misinterpret not only what Lee Strasberg had to say, but what he got from Stanislavski, which is you do all of this internal work, this sense memory stuff, all of this wonderful work in the service of a play. Exactly. If you, or, it's, or it's just selfish. It's just, or, or, you're just masturbating. Yeah, you're just you doing, know, oh, I'm doing this and this and this. What does that have to do with the character and exactly. the character's needs? You forget that. I mean, if, if, play, if, if, if you read an act of repairs by Stanislavski, he will tell you all of this wonderful work is in the service of the play yeah. and the perversion of the method, quote unquote, making it about the actor instead of the play is, in that, is just that. It's a perversion. So you want to stop and pause for, is there any any questions uh, that come up sure. so far that we're getting uh, online? Can we have, ah, uh, sorry. Go. We have Aaron. Aaron, you have, you have a question. Where, where is Aaron? It's right here. Sorry, right in, he's in that little box that looks uh, like a television. Oh, he's there you are. There. <laughs> I think he's, might, no, he's not, we don't see him. Oh, we but don't I see him. I think he is want. there somewhere. Okay, we're looking at Aaron. He's on the other side of Aaron. the scene. All right. Yeah, you have to, you he's have actually to over there. Or, hi. 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 I just have a question. Uh, yeah, we figured. The, uh, <laughs> regarding the actor who's a bit of a jerk off camera, um, how would you feel if you go slightly off script and just react to what he's giving you and basically saying something like, um, are you okay? Is everything fine? Or you mean, that, you mean, you mean should you provoke him? No, I mean, if, uh, like, the example you gave about um, the actor well, making that... Yeah, funny. I know. I mean, you probably... I mean, unless you want to start a war on the set, uh, I, I don't think... And you don't want to... And if you are going to start one, you probably don't want to do it on camera. Uh, but, um, I mean, yeah, you can certainly ask him off, off when you're off, is what's up, what's going on. Uh, it depends. Some people respond well to that. Some are just a bundle of nerves and can't... They go, what? What do you mean? I'm there for you. What are you, what are you talking about? Uh, it all depends. You have to, you have to play that neat. Now, uh, I'll give you an example. A, a, something that, uh, we, I'm not sure, I think you were there for this on Easy Streets. We had two terrific actors. Uh, Joy Pantliano was one of them. And uh, Jason Gedrick was another. And uh, you, you were there because the, we were shooting the scene where he was being released from prison. Okay. Here's the scene. Uh, Joey Pants is waiting on his car for Jason Gedrick's character to come out of prison. And Joey, his character, his need is to give him a ride home so that he can talk him into doing something. <laughs> Jason's need is to get the hell away from Joey, right? <laughs> because he knows Joey is trouble. Okay, so they come out. In that moment, it's hot out, right? So, and Joey, wonderful actor, but he's playing that it's hot. 
And so he's sitting on the car and he's sort of just sitting back. Yeah, hey, how you doing? And Jason comes out and walks up and Jason, Jason's character goes, hey. And, and uh, Joey goes, hey, how you doing? Da -da, says the line. And, da -da -da, and the scene goes on like this and this and this. So, okay, that's take one. So uh, Jason comes up to me and says, Paul, if he's acting like that, I'd walk away. I said, good, walk away. So what do you mean? I said, walk away. If he's not going to hold you there, walk away. And I didn't tell Joey this. So I see and start the same. Joey's sitting there. It's a hot day. Hey, how you doing? And Jason Garrett goes, I'm fine. He starts to walk away. <laughs> and suddenly, Joey gets up and goes, hey, where are you going? You're, you know, and he does the lines, but he has to pull him back in. He has to do his job. Right? So the truth in that situation, doing what was instinctive, suddenly made that character alive and made the scene great. But so Joey wasn't playing. So that's a good example of what you can do. That, play your instincts. That, that, that's really the answer to the question. Most actors don't want to be jerks, um, you know, and, and most actors don't know they're being jerks. I think what Paul said most importantly is you don't want to have a war on set. So how you deal with it is really important as a director. And if Paul went over and said to that actor, what are you doing? You've got to give us something. There's a war about to happen there because he's now being attacked, he thinks. So you, what you do is just say to the actor, Deal with the truth of what they're giving you. Yeah. Just deal with the truth. And by dealing with the truth, by walking away or by looking at this face that's going on, is everything all right? That forces the actor to come back and give you something because you dealt with it not in an attack level, but the truth of what's going on yeah, in so the So he didn't scene. have to change the lines. He just his, he changed yeah. his action. Walk away. You know, so, and they got him back. And I promise you, if you're, if you're a director, you're asking that question, that's how to deal with it. The minute the director gets involved in that, that's a real problem. You have your actor say, listen, deal with the truth of the scene and everything will be fine. Sorry? I didn't mean to be a jerk at the same time because he was a jerk. It was just like adding... Maybe no, no. Line, so, like, sometimes, you know, people, wow. sometimes people are jerks. And sometimes they don't know they're being jerks. But I promise you, every actor on set, for the most part, probably wants to do good work. So and when they're dealt with something like that, an actor walking away in the truth of the scene, they respond so. Trust in, trust in that process. I'm texting people who should know that we're on camera. We are on camera. <laughs> doing um, we have Pedro has a question. Class. Hi, Pedro. Paul is Hello. texting. I'm telling people not to annoy us. Masterclass. Hello, Pedro. Hey, hey, Bobby. Hey, Paul. How are you? Hey, Pedro. All right. Uh, listen, I, I'm, I have a problem with my script, and that is this. Rewrite on the script. At what point do you stop the rewrite and just say, this is the best it's going to be at this moment. I cannot get any more, I cannot get any more uh, opinions from other people because they fluctuate between, you know, 50% say this, 50% say that. You take whatever you can into consideration. You do your rewrite. You work on it for years. And now you just want to let it go because especially since when I see the final product of some of these scripts, than nothing like the original script that was submitted that was bought. So how do you get to the point where you get a producer, unless you do it yourself, um, to just say, hey, um, uh, we're going to go with the script and then we're going to make the changes? Paul? When do you stop writing? Uh, uh, go for it, Bobby. Uh, uh, <sighs> Boy, you know, this is, a, this is a really good question, Pedro. Uh, and the answer to your question, b believe it or not, um, is as simple as this. Look inward. Look inward. Ask yourself, what is the story that I'm trying to tell? And am I honestly telling this story on the page? And why is no one else getting it? If you start listening to opinions about the story that should be told and you start trying to tell their story as opposed to your story, that's when you hit a really big problem. And sometimes, and more often than not, you will get a note from a producer and you'll think it's garbage, okay? And more often than not, it's not garbage. Here's the difference between a good note and a bad note. Most producers are pointing at an idea that's, or something that's wrong in your script because they see that it's wrong, but they don't know how to fix it, okay? So if you listen to the idea that there might be something wrong in the script, don't listen to the fix. Just trust that if they're seeing something, there's probably something you've missed. All right. That, and, that's and, and here's what I'm, it's Pedro, right? Yeah. Yes. Pedro, have we ever met? 
Uh, no, but I, okay. I know about it's okay. you. Okay, I don't know about you. Uh, but here's what okay. I, here's Pedro, I sense frustration in your voice. And I feel that frustration. Uh, I feel it deeply. It's this frustration that all writers have. What I also sense in your voice is resentment. That will kill you. It will kill you. You cannot resent the process. I am writing something now, and without notes, I think I'm on my 450th draft, because I haven't got it right yet. I haven't got it right. I'm just doing it again, and I get through it, and I get a note. I go, uh, we know no one likes being told that they're, they're, what they've written is wrong. No one except for me. <laughs> because if it's wrong, I get to go back and spend more time with my characters. And that's a joy. I get to spend time with my characters. It's all I live for. So, if you tell me my, that scene's wrong, I'll rewrite it. I won't necessarily do what you say, because your, your, your suggestion, as Bobby said, could be very wrong. But almost always, when someone points out that something is wrong, here's what you should know. It's wrong. Yeah. What they're saying may not be correct, but there's something wrong. It may not be that scene. It could be two scenes before you screwed it up. It could be the first line of the goddamn script, and you're talking about the ending. You haven't planted the, the, the ending in the beginning. There's so many ways you can mess up as a writer. But what you do is you, we have this gift, whether someone is paying for us to do it or not, and many times they don't. Almost everything we've done, everything I'm doing now, no one paid us to do and no one is paying me to do now. And I could not give a shit because other than having to pay my rent, I get to spend time with my characters. So celebrate that. And ask yourself the questions. Why? What's, what's bothering them here? Come up with your own answers. Try that. Try, but, but a writer should be willing to throw out everything except for their initial, you know, no, except for their gut. Throw out everything. Uh, the writers who hate rewriting aren't writers. <laughs> you know, you got to love rewriting. And if you don't, you don't love it because you don't like criticism. I don't mean you particularly. I mean, in general, most yeah. writers don't like criticism. Learn to love it. Yeah. And, and, and the most important thing that Paul said, based, he said a lot of important things just now for any writer anywhere, is this idea of resentment. You get resentment because you start thinking that you're writing for the producer to give him or she what she wants. The biggest mistake anybody can make. Once you start writing for someone else, you are no longer truly writing. No longer, I'm sorry. So you take what they had to say and you ask yourself, why are they finding something that doesn't work in the script that I thought work what, what's missing and you take that note you don't take the fix you take the note and you let it serve what you're after does that make sense Pedro because uh, let me tell you absolutely this man is I, I can only think of one person I can only think of one person who is more annoying than Bobby Moresco <laughs> uh, and that's why I treasured working with him and there's a story I've told many times and it's absolutely true we're right in crash I've had an outline, uh, I've sent it to Bobby, he's told me it's not a movie, I say, I think it is, he now thinks he didn't say that, he did. Uh, and I said, I know, but I, I think... I, I think, think I said, I think it's a TV show, Paul. No, but no, you I... didn't, you said it's not a movie, Paul. I said, yeah, but I think we're going to write it anyway. So we came to my house, and we started writing based on all this research I'd done. I'd done two years of research, I'd done, I'd done an outline that I that has, of, 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 from characters and scenes and things that I dreamt of and woke up and written down. A lot of it didn't make sense, some of it did. There was the connectivity, I had the themes, etc. and Bobby and I just sat down to write. Anyways, bang to bang to bang, the way we were writing is I'd sit at the computer, we'd do it different ways, but this day I'm sitting at the computer and I'm the one typing. And he's in the, the corner uh, of my, my office over there in the nice comfy chair and he's reading the stuff that I printed because we've got, we're on page 20, so I printed the first 10 pages or so, maybe longer. And so uh, I'm on page 22 or whatever it was and we've, I have a problem. I have these two kids who are driving down the street in a car they've just stolen. And they're saying some clever things, but nothing is happening. Something has to happen. There has to be a barrier. Something has to happen. And uh, so, and I say, Bobby, what, what, what could be the barrier here? And what, what could be the, the obstacle in this scene? Because it's just, they're, they're driving away. There's nothing wrong. And he goes, what? So aren't you listening, Bobby? I've got this scene. Explain the whole thing again. It's here, da-da-da-da. I need the obstacle of the scene. And he goes, 
I'm sorry, Paul. I, 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 what, what, just say that again. Bobby, where the fuck are you? I'm right here. Okay, I'll explain the whole thing again. Da, 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 the obstacle. He goes, yeah. I go, what are you thinking about? I said, he's at page four. I said, Bobby, we're not <laughs> on page four. We're on page 22. Come to the program. Oh, sorry, Paul. Sorry. No, really want to do it. Explain the whole thing again. I, I just can't get over something on page four. What the hell is on page four? So I go back and I look at page four. And he goes, yeah, something's wrong here. Damned if he isn't completely right. So we go back and we rewrite page four. You know? And we get through that. We work through that. And finally, he's freed up. And we go, okay, page 22. Okay, well, they have to write into something. Those guys were on page four. That woman was speeding. That woman was speeding. Why was she speeding? Why could she not see a police car with flashing lights? Why? She, her mind must have been on something. You know, something, something really emotionally important. Her husband's in the hospital. Why? Because he got run over by a couple of guys speeding on page 22. <laughs> and so, so, and ah, so there came the answer. So you have to be open, to be open to a really annoying human beings with great notes. <laughs> yeah. but, but you also have to understand the enormity of that question. It gave us the rest of the script. Uh, w without that, there, we don't have, you know, the simple question. Uh, well, why did, why, why did she not see these? Why did she not see these lights up ahead? Traffic lights, policemen. Oh, she was emotionally distraught. Her husband had been run over. Then the question becomes, why was her husband run over? I don't what know, Paul. Doing? What do you think? What was he doing there at night? What was, what he, was he doing? He had <laughs> oh, some people in the back of the truck. And, and, you know? and, and then suddenly that whole thing with the van at the end of the movie crashed. That's all of that came from that question. Yeah, yeah. Now, if Paul's sitting there saying, Bobby, I don't give a shit about page four. Let's move on. I forced him to move to that. We would never have found that. So, so you gotta, you got you to gotta be open. you got to be much more open than you think you are. And, be, and, and you have to and if, if celebrate you, if you, rewriting. If you think that this is just an exercise that two writers are talking about who had some success, it's not. When Paul read the, uh, sent me the first draft of Million Dollar Baby, which I was not involved in at all, I came back and I said to Paul, I don't, I don't think this works at all. And, you know, Paul had taken three, he had taken three stories from a book and put them into five the movie, stories. Five, five stories. Five. And I said, Paul, we only need two stories. Now, he had just spent a bunch of money on the book. He had and just he, written a whole movie it? without me. And he could have said to me, are you out of your mind? I'm not losing those stories. I paid a lot of money for those stories. I put my blood into those stories. He didn't do any of that. He said, you know what? I think you're right. Let's go to work. Yeah. So he sat with me while I wrote for the next two weeks. And I paired off the other stories. And he got down to, to, to the, the elements from three different short stories put them together it worked like a charm two weeks later the script was done no that's after a year of struggling yeah uh, you know and this is a man that uh, truly had bought the rights to the book he had put his heart soul into it he could have been resentment resentful but that's that gets you nowhere but the big point about resentment and we'll move on pedro is is when a writer thinks he's writing for someone else as opposed to himself in addressing a note you that's when you're yourself. dead yeah that's when you're dead yeah, yeah. I hope write you for get yourself that. now there is the occasion when people are just dead wrong. Sure. Usually they're driven by some other motivation other than a good story. They're trying to get you, and I've been there because I had a producer who, once we finished Million Dollar Baby, very much wanted to have Arnold Schwarzenegger star in it. He wanted Arnold Schwarzenegger to play an Irishman and a boxing manager. Why? Because he knew Arnold, and he could get Arnold, and, it could, and he could finance a movie with Arnold. I didn't think Arnold was as Irish as, as I wasn't as he sure thought. either. Exactly. <laughs> so I said, "No, uh, that's a bad note. I'm not going to rewrite it." He said, "You can just call it. You can, no, rewrite. Call him the Swede. It would have ruined that movie completely." And you have so, to understand. No, I'm not putting Arnold Schwarzenegger in Million Dollar Baby and calling him the Swede. And, and you have to understand, this is a no from a writer who is dying to make his first major dying. feature film. He's saying no to that because it's not going to be good. It will be a bad movie. Yeah, that, nobody, that requires courage. Nobody writer, nobody director. It was television, which yeah, is, it, at it, that time was worse than, yeah. than being nothing. So the, the stigma was terrible. It requires courage sometimes to know when you be giving a bad note as well and to understand that I should not do this. Yeah. I didn't have to argue with him uh, yeah. because it, when you don't have to argue with people, you just go, no, I, I can't do that. Now, so know the difference. 98% of the time, it's not that. 98% of the time, something is wrong and we just exactly. don't want to face it. But if you tell yourself that you get to spend more time with your characters, my God, it's a blessing. Thank you. you know, Thank you, you Pedro. Get, you, know, you get to live in that art for longer. And that's all writers do. We live, we live in that moment that we live with those characters. 
you know, that, that's what writers do. And I've been doing it in this project now. I've gotten wrong many, many times. I've been doing it for nine months. I'll do it for another nine months if I have to, to get it right. It's what we do. Writing is what we do. Rewriting is what we do. Um, so, you, you know, be thankful that somebody cares enough to read your script and give you the note and yeah. then try to be discerning and smart enough to understand the difference between yeah. a good note and a bad note. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. Shall we, Paul, move yeah. on? Or? Who, uh, any other, uh, uh, thank Fetty? Thank you. Thank you. you very sure. welcome. Yeah, we, we have a lot of other questions. Shall I go on? Please. Yeah, go on. I just need some yeah, okay. water. But you go on. So, re, uh, we have Richard and then Ash. Richard? Yes. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. We Thank sure you. can. Okay. Uh, so, you do know me, Paul. I was in, uh, I took your I took your story class a few months ago. Oh, I recognize uh, your voice. Hi. Right, right. Hi. Uh, so I just have a, just kind of a follow-up to the question that Pedro was just talking about, but a little bit different. What do you do if you have an actor who, um, how do you handle an actor on the set who insists upon improvising every scene and ignoring what you did write? <laughs> Bobby? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, first of all, there is only one time that that has actually happened, and it happened on the set with Paul Haggis, who was directing and I was producing with him. Uh, I, won't okay. name, I won't name the actor, but he was an Oscar-winning actor. Um, Paul, you know what I'm talking about on no. Easy Streets? No. On Easy Streets, in the hallway. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I'll, I'll speak to the specifics of it rather than the general question. Uh, this is an okay. Oscar-winning actor who just showed up. He had one big scene. Well, we admire. We just admire dying, it. Dying to work with. Uh, everybody who ever knew anything about acting admires this actor. Um, and the it's a big scene at the end of this pilot that's very important to both Paul and I. Paul is directing. I'm producing. We're both in this tiny little hallway. And the scene is where the hero comes to his father, and the father tells him everything he ever wanted to know in terms of the emotional needs and the plot. Nothing will make sense if these words are not specific and on the money for the audience and for and the character. Devastating, devastating emotion. Devastating to to the the, yes. the, the character. So um, we we uh, Paul's directing. We set everything up and we shoot the first take and we realize this Oscar-winning actor who we all admire does not know one single line in the script. To be fair, the man the man is by the eighty something by them. Yeah, he was older. That, that, yes, thank you, Paul. He he was older than uh, than most of us then. Uh, so I, I can tell you what Paul decided to do as a director and what I tried to do and to help as a producer is we uh, we do the take and Paul would say to me, okay, uh, let's look at the script. I think he might have said something like this line here. I'm going to reshoot it. You'll get him to say the other two lines in this speech. And then Paul, <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. Then Paul would then shoot it again and we'd go back and Paul would say to me, okay, he said this line here that's almost right. So get him to say these other lines in this next take. And but that I, was just a matter of the the, the fellow just it was he, he was losing it, yeah, he was and losing. he was a great great actor. So we it, it wasn't his fault. He would just he couldn't remember the lines. But boy, when he delivered them, he was goddamn well, good. Uh, well, he was a brilliant actor even without knowing the lines. And Paul was smart enough to go with him and just go. T and we never said to him, "You have to say these lines." Never said that because no. that's that's death for an actor to say yeah. you're fucking up. Pardon my language. So Paul would send me over and to say, okay, you know, uh, you know, these lines here, we might get a little closer if you'd say it that way. And when it was done, I promise you, this actor who knows what truth is all about and saying in the moment got the best reviews of anyone in the show. Yeah, it was brilliant. <laughs> it was brilliant. You have, you have to, every, every technique is different. That one, obviously, that wasn't just, he wasn't spiteful. No, no. Uh, he was, uh, uh, he, he, he just couldn't get there. So you find a way to get there. I mean, I love the fact that I believe I and Bobby can get a performance out of just about anyone and you have to have the faith that you can do that yeah and now whether you get they're gonna say the exact line or not it doesn't you know it's all a matter of how long how important is that specific line exactly be said that way it might be very important and some of this is what Bobby is saying some of those lines were very important they had to be said. So we kept going, kept going different ways until we, they were said pretty damn close to what they were supposed 100%. to be. 100%. Other times it's not, you know, it just, it's conversation. You know, what the hell? But, but go ahead. The lesson to be learned from that was neither the director and creator of the show nor the producer ever went to the actor and said, you don't know your lines. 
That doesn't help anybody. No. That doesn't help. But I will tell you this. Paul said the actor was around 80, and there was a moment where that actor is found dead in a box. In a his little tiny... In a, a barrel. Oh, in a barrel, thank you. He insisted Bloody, on being in there. He insisted on not letting a body double be the body, even though you could barely know it was him. He said, no, I have to be in. So this is a true professional. So, you know, yeah. it, but whatever the instinct is, your job as a director, like Paul the, did that day, if but, I may finish one second. Oh, sure. Your job as a director Can I just is cut you off? what Paul did. Can I keep did. cutting you off? Huh? Can I just keep cutting you off? Yeah, please. Like this? Okay, I, go ahead. This is like the give and take. This is like the... the, 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 the you give, I'll take. <laughs> <laughs> what Paul did that day as a director was figured out a way to get the performance, and this is what a director does, no matter what that is. Yeah, yeah. So, now, if you need the line, you know, maybe the best thing is just to explain to the actor why you need the line. Just say, this because perhaps they just don't understand why you need that specific line. Usually, uh, uh, someone does something just because they th have a different take on it. They don't un quite understand wha what the importance is. So you go, listen, no, that's very important that this way, and then listen to them. Why are they saying it that way or changing it? Now, some actors are famous for changing all the lines, coming in with a whole new script in the morning, having rewritten everything. There are actors who do that. There are big actors who do that. I've, thank God, never worked with one. Even I'm, No, I've, I've worked with ones who have the reputation of that, but they've never done that to me because they tended to like the script was going in. The script better be good yeah. because you know what? There are actors who, do, the actors who do that. Some of them are just assholes. The other ones just don't suffer fools. And you know what? If your script is not up to it, if you haven't done the work on it, you're a fool. You better make sure the work it's ready. And if, and, and, you know, and if you've had a chance, you should be reading it, rehearsing it with them. Yeah, yeah, it's because there could be flaws. It could be something you're not seeing, you're blind to, and the actor can see because the actor is looking at it a different way and is in the moment. So and is you know is in the character in the character's head. So, so do a rehearsal, man. You know, just just to find and then it'll come out. A absolutely. Workshop it. A absolutely. I will give you a, a, a notion of a good actor. I like I, I like to saying to an actor early on before the day. You don't wait until the day before it at the rehearsals Paul's talking about. And I say, listen, any of the lines bother you, let's talk about them. We can figure out a better way. You know, I, say, I said to Alec Baldwin about something we were going to work together on, and I said exactly that bef before the day, before rehearsals. Anything that doesn't work for you, let me know. I'm, I'm happy to rewrite for anything that's better. And, and Alec simply said, no, I'll say the lines in the script. I like them. Yeah. But you yeah. give them the opportunity, you know, because of their problems as a director and writer, let's see what they are. Let's deal with them. But if you wait until the day, then you're in trouble. Yeah. So we have, a, we have, Fede, we have a question in the room here. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Del, del film in modo diverso del personaggio e mi chiedo quanto sia importante quindi uh, from what you are telling us from what you are describing what I understand what I get is that uh, very quite often or sometimes the uh, writer writes uh, in a specific way and the actor is supposed to play that role that part perceives the scenes maybe in a different way so I'm wondering quanto sia importante il lavoro di creazione da entrambi i lati? How important is the creation work from both sides? Cioè, il lavoro insieme. Working together. Well, the, 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 best, the best work is done when actors, uh, uh, well, all artists collaborate. That said, sometimes the best work is uh, the best work is always done i think when there is an individual vision the artist's vision and that could be the writer it has to, should end up being the director and that director's job is to um, is to transmit that vision to you now if you don't get that vision if if if, if the director is going you know what this scene is this scene is orange and you're going what's orange you go no no it's orange and you go yeah 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 but what's orange you go, <laughs> just act orange okay just you know do your job and act orange um if you don't get that if you're not into playing orange that day or don't understand it it's going to be horrible 
Or, but if you go, ah, orange, yeah, yeah, I can be orange. But otherwise, you gotta, you know, you're gonna have a mess. So, I could, we, we have to create. Here your, and please, here. Okay. We have to create and destroy in, in a minute what. Um, if it's better. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yes, if it's better. If a good actor comes to you and said, I've thought about this scene, and I'm not sure what's in the way, as Paul spoke about before, what's the barrier, what's in the way to getting my need, then therein lies conflict. If you as a writer or director can't answer the question and why the scene, okay, the scene is about orange because orange went here. What he did earlier in the scene, remember when he did that? Well, we're after he had now is going to give him this thing later on. And the actor goes, oh, now I know what the scene's about. Okay. I understand. Thank you. Or if you can't answer the question, then the, direct, the actor's going to answer it for himself. Uh, yeah, yeah, they are. And, and it might be a different answer than you're prepared to accept. But you know what? You didn't answer the question, so the actor's the one on ask. camera. Yeah, so you know what? The yeah. actor has to have responsibility. Uh, actor's on his own, baby. He's going to go on. I'll give you for instance. I was shooting a big shootout in a movie uh, with Giovanni Ribisi. And it was on the night. We got all the cameras set up, five hours, six, seven, eight cameras. There was going to be an explosion as they go in through the door. And right before gi shooting, Giovanni came over to me and said to me, Bobby, what's the scene about? <laughs> now, we're, right. about to, we're about to shoot. Mm -hmm. you, you broke my microphone, Paul. <laughs> uh, if I don't know, and um, if I don't have the answer to that question, he's going to do whatever he wants to do. I did have the answer. I said, this is about your brother who three scenes ago was murdered. That's what this scene's about. It's about something human. And Giovanni said, I got it. You watch that movie called Tenth and Wolf and this big shooter at the end, it is all about emotion. It has nothing to do with the shootout that's going on. Go watch the movie, Giovanni Ribisi at the end of Tenth and Wolf. It's wonderful amazing actor. what he, wonderful actor. And uh, how many actors would ask the question, what's the scene about? What's the human thing the scene's about in a shootout? Not many. Good actors will ask the question. The other thing, the other thing is Thank writers you. need to ask that same question uh, about when they're writing that scene, that action scene. Action scenes, uh, no one cares. You have someone runs and jumps, and there's a beautiful shot of them running and jumping. Uh, and there's a crane, and there's, a, there's, there's birds flying underneath it, and there's all this pyrotechnics that go off. No one cares unless we care that that actor who's running and jumping gets to that other side. He has to have a desperate reason to get to that other side, an emotional reason. When I was writing uh, uh, Casino Royale, for example, there was a there was a scene in which I need I need an action scene uh, because every so often you need some action. And so uh, the uh, Bond and Vesper had gone up to a hotel room, and I knew there had to be a fight because there was a guy there. I forget the circumstances, but I knew there had to be a fight. And I started thinking, okay, I'll put them on the top floor. I've never seen a fight on a stairwell where the people are falling, like falling from one stairwell to the other and grappling all the way down, pushing the other one, grabbing, pushing. That, would, that could be a fun, it's a very simple idea, but a cool one. Okay, that's the cool idea. Why should I care? Okay, so I don't. I mean, I care that Bond lives, but Bond's gonna live anyways, because he's Bond, you know? He's gonna do another episode, another series. Uh, he's gonna do 10 more uh, movies, he's gonna live. <coughs> so, why should I care? Ah, okay. I'll send Vesper down those stairs. I'll have her run down those stairs first to get away. Bond throws his get down there for whatever reason she had to run down. So she runs down the stairs. Great. Lock the door at the bottom so she can't get out. Now I got two men with knives falling towards her. And there's your suspense, right? They're falling towards someone, right, who can't get out the door. Good. Okay, then they're going to get to the bottom. And yes, Bond is going to kill the bad guy, but he's going to kill her, him right on top of her. He's, she's going to be pinned to the wall, and she, he's, going, he's going to stab him, which, and, and he's going to get blood. She's going to blood all over this woman. Now, suddenly, you have a scene, which then leads to the shower scene, which, you know, she's, they're, they're he's in his clothes, etc., and she's falling apart, trying, getting, trying to get the blood off her from this experience. So... The action scene wasn't enough. That's just an action scene. And, but most people would just go, no, it's an action scene. They, they get the way by, they kill the bad guy. Big, big deal. Okay. No, killing the bad guy is not enough. How does it emotionally affect your protagonists? You know, and that's, that's, why, that's, that's what elevates an action scene. It's, it's a brilliant uh, dissertation on what to care. Listen, there's a central question that all of us ask ourselves, which is what am I hoping for and what am I afraid of? 
meaning me, the audience, when you're writing it. In that case, Paul answered the question. You're hoping Nicole gets out, and you're afraid she's going to die before Bond can get there. Now, now, if you can answer those questions, you can write something human, no matter what the scene is. What am I hoping for? What am I afraid of? Yeah, and then you don't always just follow. I mean, I was writing this last thing, and I was going along. I won't tell you what it was, but I knew from the very beginning of this thing, you talk about go to Pedro on those notes. I knew what I was going to explore, and now I know how I was going to explore. I thanked God because I knew how it was going to end. Because an, an ending is everything, right? I knew exactly how it was going to end, uh, and I thought it was a pretty damn good ending. So I wrote the thing. It's pretty good. And I, I like to read uh, at night, so I was reading a little bit and happened to be reading something on literary criticism. So I was reading something and, and something stuck in my head. I forgot what it was, but it was... As I went to sleep, this thing was rolling around in my head. I said, there's something wrong with the ending. There's something wrong. What? It's a good ending. The whole movie, the whole thing, the whole story is based on the ending. I've known the ending for years. Yeah, yeah, but something's wrong. Huh. And this character started talking to me. He said, you're not being honest with the theme. You have a theme. You've betrayed the theme. I went, fuck you. Get, <laughs> out, get out of my <laughs> dreams. Leave me alone. I went, shit, they're right. I've betrayed the theme. How do I be true to the theme? Oh. I ended up killing the people who I knew were going to live, elevating the people who were secondary characters to major characters ten, throughout the entire ending woke up realized I had to do that and was thrilled to do it yeah. thrilled to throw out the last third of the story because that was going to elevate it and this, so the, 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 the heroine was going to live the hero was going to die because, and this heroine was a, a, a secondary character for Christ's sake she just kept taking over the goddamn story because she was so much more interesting than the hero and so, you know, and the hero basically wants to die. And so I'm going to let him. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the villain, you know, just pisses off the villainess. And so she kills him. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, whoa, whoa, well, just a second. These two guys are going to shoot. And the other, neither of them is fucking alive. <laughs> what are they going to do? Well, it was just, it was just electrifying because I didn't know what I was going to do. But I kind of knew. And, and, and suddenly, suddenly I had a good ending. So like, don't assume that you've got something, especially if you decide ahead of time. It may not be the right but, thing. But also what's incumbent about what Paul just said, which is also absolutely on the money, is he said, oh, I betrayed my theme. That means he knew what he was writing about. If you understand thematically what you're writing about, it tells you where to go in your movie. And you don't yeah. always stand at the beginning. No, no, often you find you out at the end of the first draft more often than not. Yeah, yeah. And you ask yourself, what's it about? What am I really getting in? What's it about me? And often what I find is I will write... I'll come up with a story, and I'll come up with characters, and I'll think those characters have nothing to do with me. They're just cool characters. They're always me, and they're always trying to figure out something that I can't figure out about myself. Yes. And they do it on screen, or they do it on the page, and, they, and it's, just, it's annoying as hell. Yeah. Uh, because, and I never get the answers, but I sometimes get really good questions. Yeah, and so, yeah, so. Uh, really, really important to, and Paul's right. It's okay if you don't know your theme when you're beginning, and it's probably okay if you don't know it until the end of your first draft. But when you start your second draft, you should know what you're writing about on a yeah. human level, and that dream, should, that theme, should drive your characters, it should drive your plot, and it should drive your dialogue. Do we have any other questions from here before we go back to the online? Sure. Anybody? Anybody? Go on once. No, 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 no. Oh, you're being really piggy. No, go ahead. No, you're a fabulous actress. They, they gave you an award last night. You get two questions. Go for it. No, 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 no. You got the microphone. Stava rispondendo, stava rispondendo alla domanda eh, parlando, quindi in realtà non, non serviva a fare. Io non sono solita a fare domande, però sono molto interessata. I'm not generally used to ask questions, uh, but uh, I was very much curious. And you were somehow answering already my question while you were talking. Right. Now, now, now ask the actual question. Palla. Go ahead. Palla, <laughs> yeah. palla, tegla, palla. Quindi, ehm, mi era venuto, avevo ipotizzato la scena di un provino quando l'attore non, non sa niente della storia, quindi prima, prima, di, un, prima di prepararsi, per prepararsi ad un provino, un attore pensa, no, rimurgina, crea qualcosa. 
e I was, uh, I was thinking of the scene of a rehearsal or better of an auditioning uh, when the actor knows nothing about the story and be, to get ready for the audition uh, the actor uh, tries to it's kind of you know thinking and thinking and kind of uh, uh, trying to make it up that's the hardest thing I think actors have to do as sides because you don't know a lot and you try they try to tell him and the casting director tells you something and the, almost the casting director was always completely wrong completely, completely wrong and, and, and if they try and so the, all you can do is the obvious and the obvious is not going to get you the job they're going to go why is she being so obvious so uh, that's the hardest thing Bobby what advice would you give in that when they just just get sides and that's all they know I, I think it's consistently the hardest thing I think you and Paul are absolutely right about that and here's the biggest mistake that actors make and they make it all the time since they don't know what the movie is about they don't eventually know what the scene is about so they just concentrate on the words because the words are there which is the last thing you should do so you have as an actor when you walk into the audition a take and what I mean by that is okay I don't know what this scene's about but here's this little girl sitting here and she wants an answer from this guy and here's the take the guy is too dumb to give it to her so what does the girl do I'm gonna push him to get smarter now that's a take right that's a take that's something's about I'm too dumb to answer the question you're the actor you're gonna push me to get smarter now something that's taken the scene so if I'm a good director, I sit and I watch and I go, wow, what a great take. It has nothing to do with the movie. It has nothing to do with the movie, but at least the scene was about something for the girl. So I say to her, you know, that take is good, but it's actually the opposite. That guy is your father, and he didn't want you to have the job, so you now prove to him that you're good enough to get the yeah, job. Yeah, so hopefully a good director will give you a note. So now, a now, now you have a take. You have an actor who has had a take on the scene. He's not, she or she is not working with the words. She's working on something emotional for her, even if it has nothing to do with the take. And a good director. Uh, often it does it I have one story that I've told several times now because it's just so damn good about that uh, and it's um, it's about the the fact that the you the director doesn't need to know what the actor is doing we don't need to know what you are doing okay, okay? it just has to be fascinating it ha we, and, and you okay. need to know um, there was a. Uh, oh fuck! It, um, the uh, I'll jump in while he's thinking. What's fascinating that Paul's talking about in my idea? I gave you a take. There's something at stake. It's Bobby, something, you there's something at stake and something in the way. And I know I'm watching this woman who wants something from that guy, and that's fascinating to me because it's truthful. It doesn't matter if it's truthful the rest of the movie. I know you didn't write the rest of the movie. Watch it. I know there's something at stake for you, and you're not dealing with the words. That's an actor I want to work with. Anyway, the I met I got to meet with an actor I just adored my entire life. I got to have lunch with him, and um, I'd asked him a question, and that was, "What was the best direction you'd ever gotten from anybody?" And uh, so the actor said, "The best direction I actually got was not from a director. It was from the person I was playing. It was a real story, and the person I was playing." And I was playing uh, a man who had just been released from prison. And he said, and I'm a little guy. So I got to talk to him, and he's a little guy. And so I got to ask him, for example, things like how a little guy is going to survive in a maximum security prison. And there were the things like, OK, that we'd all heard before, the cliches that are true, that you got to, you know, somebody comes at you, you got to knock him back, whatever. The guy said, yeah, yeah, you got to do all that here's what I did and as he said and they're at a restaurant in Beverly Hills or something and he says uh, in fact I, I do it to everyone I meet I just did it to you and the actor goes really he goes, yeah he said when I meet someone for the first time I look around and see how I'm gonna kill them if I have to how will I kill them and so I'll look at the table and go, okay, there's a fork there. I could stab him in the eye. The knife is dull. I can't use that. Glass, I could, a bottle. I'll hit him with the bottle. And I said, as soon as I decide how I'm going to kill you, I can then relax. So in this actor did this, it went, thank you. And the actor, without telling the director ever, did that in every single scene of that movie. 
and you would never know, but it made it so alive, so active, is because he was a guy who sat down with you and he was going to see how, you know, how, how, you know, how I'm going to kill you on your few chairs. And, good. and then relaxed, and you see it, and it's like fucking brilliant. So the director didn't need to know that. You need to know it. What's bringing That's this? What right. is your need? His need was, I can only relax when I know how to kill the person. The specificity of that choice is what will become interesting. None of that has to do with dialogue. Yeah, that's it was, it was Dustin Hoffman. So he's one of the great actors yeah. of all time, right? So, but that's what yeah, Dustin yeah, Hoffman yeah, does yeah. when he approaches something. Yeah. Oh, she has a question. Okay. Uh, I, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Hi. Um, <laughs> I'm not trying to speak English because I'm not so good. Volevo okay. chiedere il mestiere dell'attore racconta delle storie, cioè la bellezza del mestiere è quella di raccontare delle storie. The beauty of being an actor is that you are telling stories, the actor tells stories. L'unico modo di raccontare queste storie è raccontarle con una verità. And the only way to tell a story is to tell it through a truth and by means of a truth. Volevo chiedergli se fosse possibile, cioè se loro credessero che questa verità possa già esistere all'interno di una persona o che comunque si possa lavorarci su per migliorarla o acquisirla. Do you think that this truth already exists within a person? Do you think it is possible to work on it, to improve it or do you think it is possible to work, you know, to acquire it? You mean can you fake the truth? <laughs> yes, of course you can. No, nel senso di uh, crearla, raccontarla anche con dei pezzi di se stesso, non fingerla. I mean, not faking it, but uh, uh, creating it or telling it uh, using pieces of yourself. Yeah, of course, uh, everything we do is a construct. It's all a what if. Uh, when I wrote uh, Casino Royale, I'm obviously not James Bond. You know, I'm obviously not a, a dashing. Uh, a man about town who is an assassin and a trained killer, fearless, can do all these things. That's not me. So I have to go, okay, what would I say and do if I was in those circumstances, if I had those abilities, if I had that charm, if I had that, uh, that the, the, if I knew I could kill anyone in, in, in this room, how would I act, what would I do? And, this, and then once I do that, I can write it, and then you, as the actor, go, what if I was there? And you create a new truth that comes from a little bit of you, but it has to come from you. The, the, you have to find that truth within yourself and go, oh, if I was that person who was fearless and could, you know, was, was, or, or had a death wish or had this, if, and then you have to find, I've, I've directed actresses like that who said, Paul, this is nothing like me. And I go, so I just keep asking them questions. Okay, this one, this one woman who was so sweet who would never mistreat this man, she had to just be horrible to this guy. And I remember her telling me a story, because I'd been out to dinner with her a couple of times, about this ex-boyfriend she had. And there was one little thing. I said, really, tell me about that moment with that guy. And she went, oh, yeah, I really <laughs> enjoyed hurting him. <laughs> but he deserved it, but I yeah, really exactly. enjoyed hurting him. I said, let's play with that. Let's expand. Oh, she went, oh, yeah, I can do that. Oh, yeah. And from that moment on, she just loved torturing this man. So, But it had to be something small within her that she then, you know, was able to... To expand upon. Paul's talking about Stanislavski's The Magic If. You know what The Magic If is? If you, ha it, uh, yeah. if you guys have not read An Actor Prepares, uh, go, go read it. Uh, Stanislavski says, brilliant. when you say to an actor, you're a murderer, he says, you're crazy. I never murdered anybody. Yeah. But then you say to an actor, what if you were a murderer? How would you feel? What would you do? And The Magic If opens up all the doors. So that's what Paul's talking about. Okay. Hi. I said I'm, I'm Russian and, and I know uh, uh, Stanislavski. Yeah. I study in, in Russian Stanislavski, method of Stanislavski. Yeah, I know it. The you Russians know, knew what they were doing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they certainly did with theater. You have to. Devi dare la particina di te, devi trovare in quel momento, devi trovare nella tua memoria. You have to find that small part in yourself. You have to find something back in your memory somewhere, something which uh, got you angry. That, that's exact, that, that's yeah, exactly no, right. No, that's no, correct. No, okay. That's, uh, that's, right. Uh, right. Uh, that's the way you can make that uh, scene truthful. Uh, uh, if you're not touching yourself somewhere, then you're not doing it. Thank you.
qualche volta, qualche volta eh, però non sono riuscita a tornare in, cioè non sono riuscita a ritornare in, in sé tu stessa perché, perché mi sono messa talmente cioè, ho fatto talmente immerse. tante talmente immerse che ho faticato a ritornare but sometimes I didn't manage to go back to myself ah, I was ah, so ah, much yeah, yeah, immersed yeah, yeah. in that oh, that yeah. I couldn't get out of it couldn't step out of it it happens with writers as well yeah. it happens yeah. with writers as well we get we get into that and then we become a more more like that person hopefully it's it's a better person but uh, <laughs> but we become you know more yeah it happens all the time Bobby to you does it no it happens all the time we learn from it look I, I, I've just finished writing and, and and we're now trying to make a movie about a father and son and like Paul, I knew the ending of the movie in the first draft because I love the father, even though he's a rogue criminal and he destroyed his son's life throughout the movie. I always wanted the father and son relationship to prevail. And then when the movie was over, I said, this sucks because none of it is true because I held on to that ending. Uh, and, and so now I've written a movie where the truth of being loyal to someone for all the same reasons is not good enough. Yeah. It's a truth I didn't know about myself. I've been loyal to many people in my life to the extent where it destroyed things that I did not want to destroy, and I never knew that until I finished the script. Yeah, that's great. You learned that, exactly. Yeah. We do learn so much about ourselves. Exactly. Uh, that's, that's often the great thing about writing or acting uh, or directing is, is what we, we get to learn about ourselves, these mm -hmm. questions that we, I mean, uh, Crash was written because uh, uh, before I even brought to Bobby, I had all these questions that I could not answer about myself, my fears, the fears of my friends, what was going on around me, things I didn't understand, it wasn't written about statements or, or, or anything. It was questions I couldn't answer, yeah. you couldn't answer. And sometimes you answer some of them. I just I did a, a love story a few years ago, and the, it was based on how three ways I tried to love a woman and failed in all three ways. And I sort of hid that in the movie. Mm. And then uh, and, and in the end, I I still didn't have the answer, but I, I just had so, I'd reached some sort of catharsis. I'd some sort of, you know, I'd think, oh yeah, I understand why I had the relationship at least. It, it, um, so it, it does help. It, it can be something wonderful for the human being who's also the writer also. I've written about a death in my family and I promise you until I had written about it I didn't understand any of how I felt. Yeah. It's yeah. It, yeah, you don't. I didn't understand any of it. And speaking of theme, that movie I just spoke to you about, my, my assistant Julia is here. And at the very top of the script, we have the line. Am I correct? The line, when does loyalty to someone become the worst thing? It's at the top of the script, yeah. and it drives every scene. And those, those things are often the wonderful things to write, uh, is that you know, you, you, a, a, a statement that no one can argue with. You know, loyalty is the best thing ever. Okay, how is that wrong? Thank That's you. That's a wonderful thing to write about. It's because, because those, those contradictions that define us. That, One hundred percent. And Pedro, if you are still here, <laughs> we uh, haven't pissed you uh, off so much, uh, Pedro. You're uh, still uh, be, be, because I'll tell you something. Here's the answer to the question: If you get a note from somebody and it does not have to do with the question of when loyalty becomes a bad thing, then it's a bad note. <laughs> <laughs> so they give you. But it might. So listen to them. <laughs> uh, exactly. Most times. They, there you are. Most times we it, should listen. Exactly. They, oh no, always listen to it, but make sure it turns into what your movie's about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that going backwards. Uh, no, Paul, I, I, there, I, I, there's Paul's point. I went back to page four. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. You did that. I love it. Okay. Uh, okay. Any questions more from online? We've only got another 10 minutes. So let's uh, see from another one from online. Uh, yeah, we, we have Ash. Hey, Ash. Hey, Paul. Ash from Grimsby, Ontario, Canada. How are you doing? Um, do wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, Bobby, hello to you as well. Hi. How are you? Wonderful. So my question is, somebody who's looking to do a short film on an iPhone, because I've seen some great films shot specifically on iPhones, with the, the audience's tension span so short these days, what would be the sweet spot, in your opinion, how long to make the film? 17 and a, and a third seconds. 17 and a half, I think. Third half. Uh, we, how the fuck do we know? Uh, first of all, we're a couple of old farts. And, and secondly, I mean, we know nothing about this. It's, but you know what? Uh, your, your questions is wrong. <laughs> What's your story? Uh, thank what you. What do you want to say? Mm -hmm. How am I going to say it? Okay, those. Now, I don't give a damn if you shoot on an iPhone or a Samsung or an Alexa or who cares? Uh, that's that's bells and whistles. Those are those are things that no one should care about. Later on, care about it. Care about it a lot because you know you yeah. could absolutely shoot a movie on an iPhone. Absolutely, but that's not the first thing you should be thinking about. And the second thing you shouldn't be thinking of is how long it is. Now, 
you can say, you can start with different constraints. Theater starts with constraints all the time. I have uh, $50 and a box, and that's, I, have a, I have no props and no money. What can I do with that? That's a good thing. Uh, it often happens. I have one location. I have $50 to, and, and, uh, to, to spend on, on, on props. What do I do? But, so you can take those constraints, absolutely. But, but try to break out of the, 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 uh, the constraints you don't need. Don't start with things like it has to be three minutes, it has to be five minutes, it has to be seven or... No, no man, don't do that. Think of the, if you want to do something that's, that you can say, okay, I haven't got a lot of money, I have got a camera, it's right here, uh, I have got this, okay, what can I do with that? Because great movies have been made with this. Uh, you know, so, uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to, and not for a lot of money, doesn't have to necessarily be a short. Could be, that could be the best thing to do. But get your idea. What do you want to say? What question do you want to ask? What are you passionate about? What are you passionate about asking? What question don't you understand? That's what you should be asking. That's how you start. What Paul just said to you is the answer to your question, what's the sweet spot? The sweet spot is the story. It's that simple. That's your sweet spot. Yeah. Find us now. You have constraints. So everybody has constraints. There's nobody who doesn't. I don't care who they are. Steven Spielberg has constraints. Uh, you find your story, and maybe you can tell it in 20 minutes. I know you only have 10, uh, but find it. Tell it in 20 minutes first, and shave away anything you do not need for your story until you get close to what you need. But always, always, always deal with your story. Deal with your story. I characters, promise you. Characters need. What's your character need? What, yeah. you know, what, what, what does this need? What's in the way? Uh, yeah. and, and then at some point, you'll get to your 10-minute movie. I promise we have, you. We have uh, seven minutes left. Uh, any other questions from the, uh, from the folks here? Anybody? Okay, we'll, uh, we'll go online. We have, Good. Okay, we have Jeffrey. Jeffrey. Hi, Hi Jeffrey. Um, thank you guys for doing this. Um, there may be a better way to phrase this question, so I apologize, but the question is, winning an Oscar, is it a hindrance or an asset? <laughs> it's a terrible, awful thing. I would recommend it to no one. I agree. It's awful. Of course it's Oscars. They're fabulous. Are you crazy? Uh, we didn't expect we were going to win one. Uh, we, I certainly didn't expect we were going to win two or be nominated for so many. Uh, none of us did. We don't do it for that. We, we were just thankful to get a little movie made. And people go, oh, you're humble. No, no. We were really grateful to get a little movie made. That's all we were trying to do. Uh, when they were going out, someone can interview us about the Oscar campaign. When uh, when uh, we got the movie in the theaters, we were like, we got to make the movie. It was in the theaters, and then Lionsgate came to me and said, you know, we're going to go for uh, an Oscar campaign. And I said, that's great because you know, there's some wonderful actors. They deserve really deserve recognition. And he said, yeah, we're going to go for best picture. And I said, don't, <laughs> don't, please. You're going to embarrass me. You can embarrass all of us. No, just please, just don't, just don't, don't, don't embarrass us. And they said, and thank God, I, they didn't listen to me. <laughs> because it's a pretty good film, and it, it won. So, uh, so, um, but you don't do it for that. You you, ne you never do it to, to start from that. That said, uh, it's advice that I give people from time to time. That you know, uh, you know, they ask for advice in your career, and I say, well, as soon as you possibly can, win a couple of Oscars. It really does help. Uh, <laughs> but, but but you know what? It's just a, it's it's wonderful to have on your bookshelf. But it's you know it's. All it does is remind you that once you were good, you know? <laughs> and so you got to keep doing. You got to keep doing the work next week. I did. And you, gotta, you know, you're just as good as the story that's in front of you. Did, did, did someone suggest to you that winning an Oscar is a bad idea somewhere? In some way, I, I'd like to know who that was. No, I just, I was just. Kind of no, no. Crazy. Well, it hurt us. It, it hurt. It hurt the movie uh, because there was another movie at that time, Brokeback Mountain, that everyone assumed was going to win. Everyone did, and then uh, it didn't. And people hated us suddenly. We went from a little film, little film that everybody loved to being hated because we the, some people had expectations i had no expectations of ever winning i didn't think we did the other movie was a great mountain it, we won we suddenly we were villains uh because we'd we'd uh, taken uh, we'd stolen something and uh, but you know, people voted what can i say i didn't uh, I didn't do it you, you know uh, here's, the, here's the honest answer though um paul hit, alluded to it a moment ago don't ever try to write for an oscar no. When Paul and I were lucky enough to work on two Oscar-winning movies together, and he did others on his own, 
I promise you, there was never one moment either one of us said, said to each other, hey, we could win an Oscar for this. No, no, it's just uh, death. That, that's the death. quickest way not to get an Oscar is right to get an Oscar. Yeah, oh yeah. You just, you so. become so earnest and so goddamn cloying, and it's just, it's just, oh, just you know, it, you'll be, the yeah. actors will be acting and crying, and you know, yeah, no, don't, and don't, I, don't do it, don't I, do it. I, even, at, even after Paul and I had won the, a couple of other awards, you know, I don't think we yeah. ever said, hey, we could win the Oscar for this. You I, know, I actually thought we could win for screenwriting after a while. I don't want to be disingenuous, because we did win a series of writing yeah, awards. But I, for Best Picture. Was oh, Best Picture was never going to happen. That's the thing. It's never yeah. going to happen. But, but it, you know, I thought, you know, we had a shot at, at this. It didn't be, there were five great films that year, and any of them deserve the, uh, all of those awards. I mean, Good Night and Good Luck, great movie. Capote, yeah. great, great movie. movie. Munich, uh, Brokeback Mountain, great company we were in. So all those films deserve the screenplay awards. They were, they were the yeah. Best Picture. They all deserved it. Uh, but uh, and it's, by the way, somebody once interviewed me. Now this is all over the, every place that, and a quote that I apparently said that my movie, our movie, didn't uh, deserve to win the Oscar. Complete bullshit. Never said it. Just so you know. <laughs> well, someone asked me in a, a line, "Do you really think your movie was the best movie of the year?" What asshole is going to say yes? <laughs> yeah, mine was better. Oh, mine's a lot better than Spielberg's or you know, or Brokeback or all. Yeah, I'm no, I said I was thrilled. To to, uh, to to be among the company, which I sincerely was. Exactly. So, nominated with those pictures, we were thrilled. And so yeah, but can I say mine was the best picture of the? No, I can't say that. That no, does not mean I don't think it was it worth it. It, it should have won. Of course, yeah. it should have won. It did. Yeah. So Jack Nicholson said to me, he said, you know what? It won. It got the most votes. <laughs> <laughs> but those, please, those any of you out there, don't spend any time thinking about that. I promise you, we didn't either. Yeah. Do have a question here to end up. What's the next question? No, we're not. Oh, right here. Oh, oh forgive me. Eh, sono convinto che ogni attore abbia delle proprie unicità, delle proprie particolarità. I'm persuaded that each actor or actress has uh, his or her own peculiarities and particular features. Come si fa a fare in modo che queste unicità del singolo attore emergano senza che però eh, l'attore le imponga? How is it possible for the actor to let this uniqueness or these peculiarities emerge without uh, having or trying to impose them, without the actor trying to impose these peculiarities? I, I don't think you have a choice. I think you have to be honest. You, you have to, you are, you are what's being brought to the scene. It's you, it's not him, it's not her, it's you who are coming to the scene. So you have to bring yourself then you have to bring the character along with you. You have to unpack the character, but you have to bring yourself. So do not think that we don't want you. We've cast you because we want you. And your take, your very individual take, your, your idiosyncrasies, whatever you have is what we want. Uh, so, uh, and then the more you s celebrate those in, uh, you know, in, in, in service of the story, the better. But if you, suddenly decide to do something that is not in service of the story, you better have a damn good reason for it. You know, uh, there's some part of yourself that is going to stop the story from progressing. You better be right. Try it, but you better be right. <laughs> and then if you're, and if you're wrong, you just, okay, fine. Uh, you go, can I try this thing? Uh, I think the character should stutter because I stuttered once when I was young. Can the character do this? Not in the script. A good director will go, well, let's try it and see. You know, and bring what your peculiar is there. And then, that ah, didn't work. Or it does work. That's fucking great. Do more. Yeah. I give you Jimmy Stewart. <coughs> Go watch any Jimmy Stewart movie and ask yourself if I should not have those idiosyncrasies. I mean, uh, John Wayne, Jack Nicholson, yeah. always idiosyncratic. Yeah. That's who they are. They bring their truth, their own truth to the work. That's what directors love. Love. Yeah. Well, it's, it's 7.30. I just want to thank, thank you. Uh, I, I, I want to thank the audience here. I want to thank those online. Thank you. Uh, it was 90 minutes of joy for us. Fantastic. <laughs> but, but, uh, but I also want to thank Pascal for doing for, this. For, for, for sure. And, and by the way, Paul just used the word joy. Look at how he was. Like a little kid over there, right? He's doing this for 40 years. I'm doing it for 45 years. I mean, we love this stuff. We, we, we find joy in it. And I hope all of you do as well. Yeah. So, so thank you. Good. Best of luck in the career and everything. Thanks. Thank you. Buddy.